Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll probably definitely need reining in, Simon, so you'll keep an eye on my time. Yeah. But this doesn't count as my time in the intro. Um, so, yeah, firstly, a huge thank you to everyone for being here today. Um, and thank you for, to Lindsay Friend and Mark Jackson from the IMT Gallery for my current show there called Glimmer Breach, which basically catalyzed this symposium event happening. And thank you, yeah, just hugely to Simon for inviting me to be a research fellow with the Visual Cultures Department for the last three years and for all of his support and for um, host, co-hosting today. I'm extremely excited to have the opportunity to bring these particular radical, sensitive, deep minds and their bodies together here, some of whom I've worked with and have been influenced by for many years, and others I've resonated with more recently during my time in visual cultures. So we're all here to share some research and open discussion around the themes that in some ways underpin the Glimmer Breach exhibition which is at IMT until at least the 24th of June, so um, do go. Um, and I hope we can make the shaping of a message a conversation, um, some kind of fictioning experiment, engaging imagination in response to difficult questions and suggestions of how we as creative theoreticians and artists can help shape alternative multiple presents. Um, oh yeah, then Simon's done the next bit. Okay, so first up's me, uh, introduced by Simon. <laughs> <laughs> Roberts, I'm sure a lot of you know, know her, but she worked as Orphan Drift, a collaborative media artist uh, that emerged in London in, uh, since 1994. Um, she's known for immersive works which treat information as matter and the image as unit of contagion. So Orphan Drift exhibited over two decades in various galleries, museums, uh, nightclubs internationally, including Cabinet, IMT, CAC, Villainous, Mama in San Francisco. Recent shows include Matter Fictions in Lisbon and Unruly City and Doll Projects. And she's got the show uh, Glimmer Breach on at the moment, IMT. But I should just say, sort of on a personal level, that I came across Maggie's work um, back in 1995, I think it was. And uh, it was part of this kind of scene uh, it was at these virtual futures conferences, and uh, I bought a copy of Cyber Positive. And uh, for me, that collective, Orphan Drift, um, was incredibly inspiring. Um, how they worked together, the sort of thing they produced. And, and then Maggie sort of disappeared. I mean, I've since found out she went off to live in on the Rim, Pacific Rim. And I'm just absolutely delighted that she's kind of back around and coming to London and part of her visual cultures. And um, just to recommend to all of you to check out her fantastic show at IMT. So, Maggie, over to you. Thanks. OK. Um, so, these are just some shots of the show. I'm reading the hashtag text piece created for Glimmer Breach while showing some of the work and talking about some of the themes. Then, if there's time, I'm going to show a clip from my asthma video, which was recently at Res, and I'm definitely going to finish with a bit about the Bushman Creative Collective I'm working with in South Africa. So, Mark Jackson writes, Hashtags are ways of translating themes and motives into lang motifs into language that computers and algorithms understand. As such, they seem to be a reaching out to AI. They also have a mysticised trait for drawing together images, sometimes with unexpected results. And lastly, there are people on Instagram, for example, that use the language form of hashtags for communicative effect, suggesting a new generation of post internetees who are becoming robot compatible. This is a word hoard of hashtags, and with special attention to include those that make reading hard, human reading, that is. And I'm not going to say hashtag uh, 120 times, but um, they're all hashtags. I'll lose them slowly. Hashtag shamanism. Hashtag electronic frequencies. Hashtag non-human material consciousness. Hashtag iteration. Synthetic information terrains. 
network communication currents, incoming, technogenesis, the lure of the spectral, climate change, haptic space, algorithms, folds, dark matter, machine vision, proliferation, singularity, Google deep dream codes, space-time melt, virtual reality, immersion, shadow objects, non-human cartographies, swamp demons, point clouds, uncanny particle life, uncertainty, after image, plastic swarms, black mirror, machine vision, incandescence, expansion, artificial colour, contactable abstract matter, eerie presence, miasmas, ghost side couplings, trophic cascades, overburdens, breach, maelstroms, toxic lakes, circulatory systems, access to time spirals, panic pulses, coincidence intensifier, Nam shubs, that's a viral programming language for the human subconscious. Coalescence, liminal shining cloaks, iridium, iterbium, technetium, yttrium, silicon, inceptionism, tightening spirals, black box mode, screen leakage, haunting distortions of form and space, the inner surface, contagion, Politics of the artificial mind. The centre falls away. A ship of fools. Genocide. The violence of excess and luxury. Resource wars. Dislocation. Exclusions. Succession. Freefall. Hallucination. Unimaginable loss. Distracted. Gilded cage. Spectral sharpenings. Open floats local dimmings, plastic conglomerates, fascinators, perceptrons, artificial neural networks, algorithm, algorithmic, <laughs> algorithmic bias amplification, <laughs> two human computation, digital noise, hidden layers, accrual, Deterritorializing de force, repetition, politics of scale, ether of strange signals, erasures, entropic emergence, experimental embodiment, the corporeal imaginary, a hundred thousand techno animals, slow devastating moss colonies, slime molds, kephalods, the feminine, emancipatory practices. Transpossession, revolt, computational ocean, porous skins, staying with the trouble, conscious exotica, desire paths, imagination as interface, entirely feasible consciousness utterly inaccessible to human experience, fragile states, becoming gradually other, fictioning, the hooks for the future, the holosonic, Mist acoustics, ridges of ancestors, agnosia, shivering water, mimetic contagion, averting the virtual, transmit, disassemble, saturation, li liquidity of force and skins, the politics of the impure, elastic trickery, hungry for touch, luminous shape shifting, white noise, biomimicry. The octopus brain body threatens boundaries. Inky deception folds, unfits colour, chromatophores, all-seeing skin, megapixel body. When white she is dying, violet patterns invisible, vibrational swellings, Z notions, process reimagined, sinkholes, fissures, fault lines, extraction, ravaged earth, places of emergence. Holes, meiotic secrets, viscosity, osmotic skins, dissolution orifices, exuberance, unbridled states, sensate logic, too many eyes, 
halos, ice effects, the Kefahuchi tract, iridescence, dark synergies of human, animal, amalgamation, machine and alien, virtual, transdimensional web makers, tactics for defying tyrannical taxonomical orders of being, inhabiting interstices in the present to feel the future, ooze, undulate, concerts, tina, spreading, symbiotic kin, polymorphous, think like an avatar, project colour and light, slip out of your point of view, vomit streams of water, make other forms invisible, make other forms visible, cosmo technologies, creative, chaotic, radical, uncompressed, fluid, plastic, surplus, glitching, sometimes violent, always contingent, random, becoming touch. Okay. In Donna Haraway's SF notebook for Document 13, she writes, overcome your ontological fear of the alien and suspicion of the mixed. They are positioned against the enlightenment's disenchantment of the world, that calamitous diminishment of the world's significance. So Glimmer Be Breach is part of a continuum, a wider project to engage with co-creating alternative futures. And in her recent review of the exhibition for This Is Tomorrow, Lauren Velvet writes, Roberts is not conducting a temporary experiment that ends at the gallery door. Glimmer Breach reaches beyond the gallery and constitutes more than the collages, objects and films that make up the exhibition. She's referring to today's event and to the Swamp Living Workshop held at the gallery a few weeks ago, which Stephanie Moran will be talking about later. Glimmer Breach has provided an opportunity to make an audiovisual experience that also holds a space for other kinds of experiment. In Swamp Living, we imagined into other species, opening into possibility, changing perception, and inducing hypersensitivity. That was um, pictures from the drawing part of the workshop. Um, so the exhibition titles in part a reference to the iridescent sheen and chroma pigments used, which only reveal themselves in certain lights from particular angles, and collage elements printed on silver surfaces, which is, it's all really impossible to um, capture with documentation. You have to move around it. And um, the sort of baroque excessive detail in many of the images and uh, things illuminated by flickering video projection light. And there's an impossibility of immersing the gaze deep enough into the recesses of image detail in, for example, this, which is called Cave, where um, right in the back of the cave there's the Milky Way. Um, yeah, I probably need to make it a lot bigger or augmented reality or, I, yeah, just that's something somebody mentioned. So you can never encompass a whole and aspects <coughs> remain invisible. And Lauren continues, the shimmering effect of these materials is subtle, not producing a glossy or illusory surface, but instead reminding us simply and directly of how our vision or lack thereof is dependent on other factors and on our body's ability to process them. And this is um, emanations of a cosmic octopus. Um, one of the monotypes in the show. Many fields of research are looking at the octopoid at the moment. Donna Haraway, in Staying with the Trouble, says, the tentacular ones feel, make attachments and detachments, make cuts and knots, make a difference, weave paths and consequences, <laughs> but not determinisms. The patterning of possible worlds at possible times, gone, here and yet to come across human, non-human, material, technological, virtual realms. The tentacular are not disembodied figures. They're human, jellyfish, fibrous, microbial, fungal, rooted, tendrilled. Also neural nets and networks, clouds and interlaced electronica, collectively producing systems that do not have self-defining spatial or temporary ba temporal boundaries. The systems are evolutionary and have capacity for surprising change. 
And Betty Marenko, who will be talking later, um, gave me a sentence a year or so ago that was, the other side of the octopus is the digital, which has um, totally gone in. Um, and I hope she'll be talking a bit about that. But uh, in case she isn't, <laughs> it's just really quickly, to make sense of the hybrid new ecologies we now inhabit, populated by entities on a continuum between the human and the non-human, a mix of the organic, the artificial, the engineered and the synthetic, polymorphous, elusive, imitative, that's ways we should be thinking. And then there's um, a review of two books, The Soul of an Octopus by Cy Montgomery and Other Minds, The Evolution of Intelligent Life by Peter Godfrey Smith. And the review's by um, Amir Srinivasan. And uh, she, it's a really great review. Um, the books are, it's a very good version of the books. Um, and uh, she talks about how in evolutionary terms the intelligence of octopuses is an anomaly. The last common ancestor between octopuses on the one hand and the rest of um, what's become human and other intelligent animal life on the other was probably a primitive blind worm-like creature that existed 600 million years ago. And now here we are facing these creatures that are the closest we can come on Earth to knowing what it might be like to encounter intelligent aliens. And obviously, they inspire the f um, creatures in the film Arrival. So mut mutual intelligibility is currently impossible. And it holds up, they hold up a mirror to teach us about the limits of our own understanding and ways of perceiving and embodiment. One of the big things is as far as people can work out, the majority of the octopus's neurons exist outside its brain, and its arms have more neurons than its brain, about 10,000 neurons per sucker. It's impossible to imagine what it's like tasting, smelling, having short-term memory, and um, seeing, probably, through the skin and the suckers. Uh, anyway, I'm going to probably move on for a bit, but... Uh, the other thing that's really interesting for me is the sort of chromatic chatter, um, which might be an involuntary metabolic effect, but maybe they're talking to themselves. The megapixel screen of the octopus's body means that theoretically it could telegraph information of almost infinite complexity, the sort of expressive bandwidth of which we can only dream. Um, and then there's the very strange and provocative Vampyrotesis Infernalis a treatise text by Willem Flusser um, who talks about the octopus's world is constituted as dynamic conglomerate there are no immutable forms I mean it exists in heavy pressure and liquid and its impressions are of the plastic plasticity of form and sensation he talks of its volatile imminence which I also really like its legendary camouflaging techniques enable the sender to become invisible to the receiver. The message is concealed and the message abstract. The messenger is concealed and the message abstract. Flusser terms the information age an octopoid revolution. The sciences must be harnessed to develop fabulous tentacles with which to feel the octopus in its almost mythical model of life's possibilities. At some point, as machines merge with organic life, it will be possible to create an artificial octopus and a human-octopus hybrid. To glimpse both sides of this emergence simultaneously means merging with one's opposite, the self distributed between facing mirrors. Um, and then this uh, text by Vivieras de Castro in The Relative Native, which I, book I was introduced to by two speakers again later here, which is John Cousins and Stephanie Moran. Hugely important book for me. Um, and I'm just going to read a small bit because I know it's going to be addressed later. When a human becomes an animal, the animal may be imaginary, but the becoming is real. So the object of becoming, 
may be a representation, but not the act itself. Secondly, when a human becomes an animal, the animal necessarily becomes something else, a different type of human, or kin perhaps. And thirdly, in the act of becoming, what changes is not the subject, but the world. Transformation, then, is not so much a process as a quality corresponding to multiple identities or to multiple points of view or realities focused on one entity. Um, how long have I got? You've got ten minutes. Okay, so I'm going to not do my asthma. Um... So just don't mind me for a minute. This is some other stills from the show where stencils with lots of glimmer pigment are um, sort of activated by video. And this is some experiments that were initially for the miasma video with um, <coughs> Google Deep Dream Code. Um, so... Okay, I'm going to do. Oh God, I'm going to do a little bit of this one. Oh. So this is called Cat Ice Trickster, and it's um, a collaboration with Jason Stapleton, the co-founder of Light Farm an audiovisual project exploring LIDAR as an emerging artistic medium. Um, and it's a machine, Cat Eyes Trickster is a machine vision avatar. It's part of the show at IMT. Um, and it's all the other, apart from the LIDAR imaging, um, it's got Google Deep Dream aspects kind of virally replicating um, some kind of artificial sublime um, and a response to a uh, text by Amy Ireland in a black circuit code for the numbers to come where she says the sense that our algorithms algorithmic systems harbour the uncanny guest in the cold and impersonal dark hollows of the net, the electrical pulsations of alien life, of the intelligence of the abyss arising in the black circuits of our late capitalism to modulate and transform our male-dominated culture. Um, Totally not got time. I want to show, I really want to get to the Bushman, so I'm just going to stop this. Uh, I was checking where I'm at. Oh no, that's my asthma. Okay, moving on. Right, the Bushman. I don't really know how, oh God, I'm going to start crying when I talk about them. It always happens. So I don't really know how to convey what spending time with the Kalahari Desert Trans Frontier Park Bushman entails. I spent most of my time crying the first time, 
not in white guilt mode, surprisingly, but because I was in sensory and cognitive meltdown, and I don't do well in extreme heat. So coincidence turns into magic and then time travelling. They're multidimensional humans who do not operate in contained worlds, materially, temporally or spatially. They send you dreams and insert eerie events into visitors' lives with empathy, concentration, a trickster thing and some very insidious leverage because they want help. They inhabit an everyday shamanism whilst the cost and consequences of colonialism and its aftermath of capitalism and climate change impact more and more strongly on their barely surviving community. Petrus Falboy, the elected community leader, and Isaac Kruiper and his wife, Lydia, are both powerful traditional healers, and they've sought outside help to form a creative collective that invites compatible outsiders to work with them to connect indig indigenous knowledges with the Western technologically augmented world. They're reclaiming their identity, weaving contemporary non-human fictions around the colonial anthropology perspective. They want the creative collective to promote a unity of spirit and be a safe space to explore healing colonially inscribed divisions. And there's an um, amazing <coughs> bit from Donna Haraway, Staying with the Trouble. The differences in details matter in ecologies, economies, histories, species, lives. It matters what thoughts think thoughts, what knowledge knows knowledges, what relations relate relations, what stories tell stories. All this in a time of unprecedented looking away, refusal to be present in. Enormity of acknowledging that we are complicit in the webs of processes that must somehow be engaged and repatterned. Our ordinary thoughtlessness. Learn to grieve, live with the ghosts so we think we can think and create as we face the consequences of what we've provoked. It all needs to erupt, intrude, matter urgently, change the story, non-innocent risky commitment, living and dying in ruined places. There's no guarantee for safety from or harmony with any of the other. So we're helping Petrus, Isaac and Lydia write things that will get the attention of museums and funding bodies, forums to which they have had little access to date, and defining a code of ethics for involvement with the collective by which the Bushmen own all work produced and determine what happens to it. Myself and my colleague, the angry, driven Hugo, have been invited to be part of the collective after Hugo spent two years with Petrus challenging the not only white male-dominated corridors of power in southern Africa that have kept the Kalahari community disempowered and marginalised. And last year they asked me to write a lengthy exhibition proposal that was trying to express what they want to do to unify the Bushman people and establish a teaching and learning centre in the desert for the passing on of the extant healing and shamanic traditions, um, to which everyone will be cordially invited. And this is Isaac in the vaults of the National Archives. And then, um, whoops. Sure. Yeah, looking through, they're finding pictures of past generations of their families that have been in these vaults for a very long time. I mean, they're finding direct relatives. Uh, it was very emotional time for them. That's Petrus again. Um, okay, well, none of us speak Afrikaans, I think, here, probably, so might leave that. Um, nearly done. Uh, 
I mean in my language, um, really listening to what they have to say, um, they want audiences to experience ancient sources of knowledge and spirituality with hearts and minds open to its importance and relevance today. And along with many other indigenous peoples across the planet, their potential for increasing awareness of post-anthropocentric thought, the environment, and what magic might mean today. Pervaded by a sense of fictions producing reality, the exhibition exposes the material processes of colonialism. Oh. Sorry. Never mind. Gone. Um... Uh, yes, exposes the material processes of colonialism, of animist connection to environment and of dream dimensions within the modern landscape. The creative collective's efforts to communicate and collaborate across language and cultural differences will be a part of this imagining. It's a story involving collective acts of trying to imagine different futures. Is humanity part of the irresistible momentum of a non-human planetary intelligence? Is it rising up to merge with a singularity of multifarious interlinked technological evolutions? Isaac Kroeper and Petrus Falboy might see the coming together of multidimensional forces none of us understand as the real singularity. Hanging out with them amplifies the feeling that this something is also and already us. Okay. Thank you. Whoops. He, um, as Professor of Art Theory and Practice, as lots of you know, in the Department of Visual Cultures here, um, he's published in the past, um, well, maybe it isn't the past, I just haven't read them, Monographs with Palgrave, Art and Cantus, Pilates and Tari. But he's doing amazing things with um, this book that is phenomenal and co edited with Henrietta Gunkel and Aisha Hamid, who's talking later, called Futures and Fictions, published last year by Repeater Books. Um, that's a must have. And um, and then Deleuze and Contemporary Art in Edinburgh University Press, that's 2009. But he, I also know him from um, organising incredibly ahead of its time stuff in Leeds called Thinking Alien, which I was very happy to be part of back in the day. And he working with David Burroughs and others under the name Plastic Fantastique, which I hope finally to uh, that, yeah he's going to present some stuff on uh, now and they've been touring with Hayward touring Hayward touring yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah all over Britain finding the people who understand the need for strange myth fictioning and there's a lot of people about and he's currently working on a collaborative volume of writings with David Burroughs called Fictioning, the Myth Function of Contemporary Art and Philosophy. And, um, yeah, he's very amazing. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, so, uh, thanks, Maggie, for inviting me to come along and talk with you on the symposium. Um, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes, I think. Um, I think you might need to put that thing on that says use
don't know if my slide's going to go. I'll just push them through if they don't. So what I want to do today is introduce two uh, research projects. One, one's kind of practice and one's more theory. And although they interrelate, and I hope that you'll see different concepts and kind of affects track back and forth across them, I'm going to keep doing this now and again. Um, and I'm hoping what, they, what you'll see is that they both speak to some of the concerns of uh, Maggie's work in the symposium. Uh, certainly the practice has affinities uh, with Maggie's work, without a doubt. Uh, and what I'll talk about also relates to things like ritual and channeling and time loops backwards and forwards and how this relates to a certain kind of what I call performance fictioning. So the practice is Plastique Fantastique and it's a collaboration or again a performance fiction as I call it with the, the main guy that I'm involved with, David Burroughs. It involves a number of other people as well, including Alex Masata, Vanessa Page, and Mark Jackson. But there's been a number of different people involved in the past. I think there's been about 20 different people involved by now. Um, but that it's settled down to a bit of a core of people. So we make installations and assemblages, and we draw comics, and we write texts, and crucially, we perform. So the images that you'll see as I talk are kind of a sampling from some of that material, a bit of a kind of narrative um, of some of the stuff. It's a kind of a collective enunciation. That's how we kind of see it, using a term from the um, radical anti-psychiatrist Felix Guattari. Uh, but another way of thinking about it, it's just an ongoing conversation that I've been involved in with the members of Plastique Fantastique for about 15 years now. It also involves trance and transformation and channeling. I mean, increasingly, I'm kind of very interested in um, trying to um, sort of sidestep from myself to allow something to come through, uh, which relates actually to something maybe I'll talk about if I've got time, which is stuff away from Plastique Fantastique, but other areas that I'm involved in, that kind of transformative work. Um, and increasingly it's sound based. I mean, what I would say about Plastic Fantastique, it's increasingly it's kind of loop pedals and, you know, microphones, and it's kind of, it's more and more like a band, really, which is kind of, oh, great, it's going. Which is a, it's great for the rest of Plastic Fantastique, but because I'm not as talented as the rest of them, um, I tend to be a bit left behind. But increasingly it's, it's sound based. So the practice could be understood as a kind of experimental research project into the sacred myth, politics, and popular culture, and what again what Qatari calls the production of subjectivity I mean that was kind of the original impetus how do we use that practice to produce ourselves differently um, so there's quite a lot to go into here particularly around what I kind of think is somatic knowledge which I think is kind of what Plastic Fantastic is about a kind of bodily knowledge um, or a kind of intuitive non-knowledge but I, I thought instead I'd just show you a selection of images as I talk so the images aren't the most recent work. They're kind of a sequence from, I don't know, a few years ago now. But I thought it would be just quite interesting to have them all up together. And they're from um, a piece called Cloud Gives Birth to New Animal, a feedback loop to call forth the neuropathine. That was at Performance Space in London. This one, which is eight diagrams or avatars, all the fantasy of the people at Wising, uh, that kind of great gallery. Uh, and then after this, you'll see... Miss Science, Evolution of Time Stretcher Tool, which was in Den Haag, and then a thing called Herb Fuchs Glitter Addiction at Wising, and then finally this thing about uh, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin fairy that we did at Dilston. Okay, so the other more theoretical project that I'm involved in, uh, as Maggie mentioned, is the one I'm going to talk more directly about today, or at least I'm going to say a few words about it. And it, it, it used to be called Mythopoesis, Myth Science, Mythotechnesis, but now it's just called the Myth Function of Contemporary Art and Philosophy. Uh, that's partly down to the publisher. <laughs> um, so there's a certain kind of historical sequence uh, to this, to this book, these, these, this mytho, mythopoesis, myth science, mythotechnesis. But the idea is really that these three categories interrelate and indeed they kind of interpenetrate. 
And in fact, the project kind of concerns itself with a mixing of these different times and temporalities. That's what it's kind of concerned with, with the drawing of different loops between different past, presents and futures, different practices, different individuals. At times with the presentation of non-human durations. So I wouldn't say that Plastic Fantastique is a case study of this kind of work, the, the theoretical work, but certainly there's conversations across. So that, you know, we do this Plastic Fantastique, I say this a few years ago, and then David and I are writing this book together. Um, and, you know, the book mentions Plastic Fantastique a couple of times. There's a bit of mythopoiesis when they're talking about, talks about neo-medievalism. And there's a bit about some early plastic fantastic that's to do with mumming plays. And then in the bit about um, myth science, you know, there's a chapter on science fiction as methodology. Uh, which talks a bit about Maggie's work and John Russell's work. And there's a bit... So plastic fantastic comes up a bit, but it's, it's not connected, really. OK, so the first thing I want to kind of do is introduce this concept of fictioning um, that the practice and to the book is certainly about. Um, so this myth project, um, this book on fictioning, it tends to cover quite a lot of ground, quite a complex and even terrain to do with fiction and fictioning in contemporary art. It's also a collaboration, as I've mentioned, with the artist David Burroughs. Um, but in fact, it always feels that it's more than just between the two of us because it kind of attends this whole host of different voices. I mean, in many ways, it's sort of like a gathering exercise. Uh, I wouldn't say a survey exactly, but it's certainly... When there's two of you, you can cover quite a lot of ground. So there's quite a lot of other voices. The diversity of perspectives, particularly with David and I, I mean, we come at things, funny enough, we sometimes read the same thing and we have two different takes on it. But if it has, does bear the mark of its particular authors, David and me, it's in this focus on the conjunction of practice and theory with the various intersections and resonances between these and the distances between the two. So in part, it attempts to give an account of an art practice, when this is very broadly construed, from both the outside and the inside, as it were, because much of the material, as well as the reading, comes in these conversations we have in the studio. Uh, Dave's got a studio in Marl End, and I'll go up there a couple of days a week, or what have you. And you know, also, sometimes the ideas that we read or talk about become t sort of tested in the practice, you know, as a, like a laboratory of testing certain ideas. In terms of two of the categories that are essential to our research project, we look at myth analysis, for example, but also to myth science. So we're concerned with conceptual analysis and interpretation, um, but also intensity and transformation. I don't know, I kind of, you know, Dave's done quite a lot of reading on anthrop anthrop anthropology and Levi Strauss and kind of those, that myth analysis that Levi Strauss does. But also with Plastic Fantastic, it's trying to kind of think about. I don't know how to say it really, kind of, um, rather than an analysis of myth, a kind of production of myth. You know. I was just going to say a couple of things about collaboration. Oh, that's the crafts logo. Uh, that's where I live in the community, though. <laughs> um, yeah, collaboration, you know, kind of, um, when I said about channeling, about trying to um, sidestep a certain fiction of the self to allow something else to come through. Um, I think collaboration can do that as well because collaboration brings you up against yourself it certainly brings me up against myself it brings you up against a certain territory um, you know, that I'm comfortable with and uh, I've, I've talked about this before but actually increasingly there's also something around uh, performance and shame and um, when I'm kind of feeling ambivalent about performances and, and ashamed basically there's, there's, there's always quite an interesting place for me to be because things start kind of happening so I'm quite interested in exploring a bit of that. So in all of this, a further term, fictioning, uh, is important or crucial. So, you know, for David and I, fiction can operate as this verb, to fiction, to fiction something. So uh, this project looks to fiction in order to explore different perspectives and impulses, so it uses fiction as a kind of resource and a a kind of methodology, methodology to explore different perspectives, impulses, and the modes of being, especially in science fiction, 
you know, taking science fiction seriously as a kind of um, set of concepts and a methodology. I mean, Dave is particularly keen on that with Peter Watts and some of Donna Haraway's work. But it also looks at other technologies of fictioning that instantiate and embody these other realities. So I'm kind of interested in this idea of lived fictions. And I think this also relates to a thing that we keep debating, Dave and I, which is the relationship between fiction and reality. I think I'm a kind of real William Burroughs, you know, <laughs> that kind of reality is a fiction. But Dave wants to hold on to there is a reality, fictions, fictions and reality, whereas I'm kind of, no, reality is a fiction. Um, but it relates to this idea of reality as being somehow fiction by human agents, basically reality scripts. So, as I've said before, in all these cases, we're particularly interested in the performance of these fictions or the embodiment of them or the instantiation of them. So this isn't really or how I think about it. It's not simply the promise and deferral of another world. It's not like a, I, I, I sort of differentiate from a utopian impulse, you know, a world that's always kind of just beyond our grasp, disappearing over the horizon. But it's somehow the embodiment of worlds within this world. That's kind of what I'm interested in. So if fictioning is this key term, then the three other important terms or markers around which we organise our research as we gather it together, the ones I mentioned earlier, um, this is mythopoesis, myth science, mythotechnesis. Um, they're not clearly, not clear-cut definitions, but they are demarcations and there are many transits and passages between them. And I thought I'd just say a bit about each of them and then that would be it really. So the first thing, mythopoesis, or how it works in the book, and the, the term mythopoesis is associated with performance fictions in the, I say the book, it's not a book yet, but in terms of the research um, around it. So mythopoesis concerns itself with a particular historical sequence. Generally speaking, in the second half of the 20th century, you know, it looks at people like Robert Smithson, looks at kind of some contemporary artists, Mike Nelson's in there, but it's a particular kind of sequence uh, and a certain kind of avant-garde take on art, I think, really, that's still apparent and in play in many contemporary practices. So, for example, as in Robert Smithson, but kind of a number of other, you know, other, other contemporary artists. It also concerns itself, this first bit, more often not, with this Anglo-American and indeed a masculine subjectivity, the kind of loner or the outsider. It seems to be... Or, although there are exceptions to all this. Um, we might describe this particular configuration as countercultural or more colloquial as concerning the bachelors. So uh, the key figure in, in this first section is Burroughs, William Burroughs alongside J.G. Ballard, really. They're the two guys that set it up. There's also a certain romanticism at play in some of the material we look at, alongside a longing or redemptive quality to some of the practices and the conceptual resources we look to. For example, there's a real interest in the past and attention to the past uh, you know, I, I've got a particular interest in the writings of Raymond Williams, the cultural theorist, and his uh, interest in residual cultures, you know, which I'm sure I don't have to remind you, but the residual cultures are those leftovers from a previous hegemony that haven't been incorporated in the present hegemony, therefore they might operate as points of resistance or alternative. So how to mobilise residual cultures or how to mobilise a magical mode of thinking, you know, thinking about some of that around um, Simondon, Gilbert Simondon's work about a pre-technical... Uh, mode of being to do with magic. So that, that's where that kind of mythopoesis section is. And David and I often use the term performance fictions to describe this kind of work, the, op the modus operandi of these practices, because it seemed to us that it's the performance of the fictions that defines our wider concept of fictioning. A sort of staging or performance of difference which seems to me, as I've said, to open up another world from in this one. It, I mean, you know, in, in sort of Deleuzean terms, it's kind of... It, I, you know, it's, it's a sort of technology of imminence, you know, I, I kind of see it as. While also demonstrating through a reflection the fictional nature of any given reality. So this is something I'm particularly interested in, David's less interested in, is kind of how a fiction, how the production of a fiction and the involvement or perception of that has a reflection back on our own reality that therefore is seen as a fiction. Funny enough, David wasn't interested in this idea, which is to do with the, the nesting of fictions and how that operates. But since he started getting involved with the anthropologists at UCL, and particularly a guy called Martin Holbrad, 
who apparently has got this idea, full from Castro, but uh, like got this idea of... Um, anyway, it's very similar to that ref reflection idea that kind of the production of a fiction then throws back the idea that reality is a fiction. So, uh, you know, sometimes I think of kind of these performance fictions as a bit like an anamorphosis, you know, like in the ambassador's painting with the skull, that, you know, you have to stand in a certain place and it co then it comes, you know, then it makes sense. Uh, on the one hand, at an extreme, these fictions can be, a pe can be a rupture in a given world or a given regime of representation, you know, like with the skull, it doesn't quite fit that representational, representational regime. But um, from another perspective, when the correct stance or posture towards it's assumed, it reveals another world that we might say is occluded by this one. You know, I suppose it reminds me a little bit, with, again, with Deleuze, what he says about the diagram. So again, it's not a promise of another world, but somehow a world from within this one. Uh, and yeah, both of us, for both of us, performance fiction also involves a further inaction or embodiment of these fictions, living out of them as real. And, and certainly David's very interested in the writings of Austin Osman Spare and his use of the practice of as if, you know, acting as if it is the case and seeing what follows. And uh, certainly kind of in sort of therapeutic worlds, that, it's also a therapeutic technology, that, to act as if. And I think, uh, thinking about this mythopoesis section of the research, um, it really is the question that both magic and non-religious ritual are ways into understanding and offer resources for thinking art practice as a kind of fiction, fictioning. You know, and I think that first section is really around the relationship between the occult and um, contemporary art. There's another chapter, for example, on kind of art scenes and collectives, which is all about... Um, Crass, the band Crass, and uh, the church of Psychic TV, and kind of rave culture, actually. <laughs> but it's all quite interesting how Burroughs plays a part there, and even with Crass. Um, so that, that's mythopoesis, that's the section. The second, uh, the second part of this project is called uh, Myth Science. And although it's partly concerned with different pasts in relation to different futures, Myth Science turns away from some of the attitudes and orientations of the, the previous section, it performs a decolonisation of it. And as, as far as that goes, it involves itself reading more recent material in the critical humanities. So this science involves the foregrounding of subjects and objects, humans and non-humans, that have been left out of the account that I've just given. Uh, you'll know, you know, the, ter the terms from Sun Ra, you'll, I'm sure you all know that, but the term is kind of uh, Sun Ra's myth science. It also takes account of um, a particular take on practice as a way of presenting and performing these difference and diverse perceptions, or what Viveros de Castro calls a certain perspectivism. And again, we take this term from Sun Ra, who's a crucial figure, particularly for David, but in the book. Um, that he, he offers some of the necessary tools of analysis alongside Levi-Strauss for this section. So although surveying and mapping out a particular field and gathering materials to build other myths, uh, this has been more central to our practice with Plastic Fantastique. This is a kind of performance at Wising. Um, indeed, I, I kind of feel such myth production needs a practice, you know, needs a collaboration. That is me, but I'm holding a mask. We're also convinced that a practice intent on this myth science must, must today oh, hang on, operate across platforms, utilise new imaging and editing technologies, along recorded and machine-made sound, but mix this up with live voice and performance. Again, experimenting a bit with this man-machine interface. Uh, this is something that we've become particularly interested in. It must also insert itself, however minimally, I think, in the world of digital images that is increasingly its condition of production and possibility. You know, this is kind of what post-internet means to me, really. Equally crucial for David and I is that fiction is a collective enunciation, even when there's only necessarily two of us involved. It's kind of collective gesture. So 
for this reason that myth science is such an important concept, namely as it does this kind of self-invention, this production of a community, this practice of transformation, to say nothing of decolonisation. And I think for both David and I, there's the, ultimately there's a limit to the conceptual work, and indeed the work of art theory, really, and I think that's kind of why we keep going with Plastique Fantastique. It might be that a practice uses concepts in order to further its aims, but it will repurpose these resources as tools rather than deploying them as self-evident explanations and interpretations, just as the reverse happens. So myth science, in this sense, is an enactment of myth, or what Sumra says is a living myth, um, the last section is called mythotechnesis. There's quite a lot about science fiction in there, and quite a lot about a recent uh, uh, philosopher Quentin Milisu's take on science fiction and trying to do something with forms of science fiction that involve formal experimentation. So that's another big interest how to produce science fiction that is not just a representation of another place, but is it? You know, or foregrounds it through formal experimentation. That's a big concern of that, that chapter. Just trying to un get away from that sort of Jameson, <coughs> Jameson thing about utopias. OK, so I'm, I don't know what the time's like, but I've got another five minutes. So the third and final category of research that, you know, these, these are like, this research has been going on for about five years now, and it's kind of just a way of gathering this stuff together, is on mythotechnesis. And um, this develops these other, if, if myth science to do with other perspectives, other, um, other modes of being or trying to explore other perspectives, then mythotechnesis takes that a little bit further and it tends to, well, I suppose you'd call them post-human articulations and configurations. Uh, and this involves what you might call a more future-orientated impulse. So, you know, if the first section is kind of magical modes of existence and deployment of residual, residual cultures and all the rest of it, then the mythotechnesis is more interested in what Williams would call emergent cultures. Um, attending to different mutations and co-evolutions of the human machine and indeed the new logics of our technological media reality more, more generally. I haven't got my glasses on, but am I right in saying Sir Hale's up there? Did I? So there's a bit on Sir Hale's work in, on derivatives, for example, in there. I can sort of either see the paper or see the people. I can't do, I can't do both. So it's in the fiction that we see these myths and these other forms and states articulate. So science fiction, again, is crucial because science fiction plays around with this man-machine interface or kind of these emergent technologies and how we might interrelate with them. But it's also in science in its own diversity of presentations um, so that's David's particular area, the, the kind of idea that science has its own diagrammatic imaginary, it uses diagrams in a certain way. John, you'll know more about that and his work on that. Um, but there's also an interest in experimental visual and sonic practice. Um, so really it's just saying that this kind of computational turn, it seems to me, has changed the grounds and the stakes of myth production. And indeed the very idea of the future, which, you know, this is from kind of from from a Sahel's work, um, this idea that the future is operative in the present, or it's itself a terrain of a kind of inquiry. So really, it's just to say that I think technological developments, um, and you know, this is why Plastic Fantastic is using many, much more technology, has redefined the terrain of fictioning and the protocols of any practice. Uh, you know, there's now the digitally produced world that now doubles our own, and more generally there's the increasing in interpenetration of machines with lived life, the omnipresence in this world. In terms of this, it seems to me there's no longer an outside, no other place from which to critique this, there's no other place for, besides the man-machine interface from which to launch a critique or affirm a utopia. Again, it seems to me it's a question of opening up different worlds from within this one that's crucial. So fictioning doesn't remain at the level of a promise, or indeed a hope. I mean, what we've started getting a bit more interested in kind of, um, uh, actually, maybe I'll leave that for the moment, the kind of, um, what would machine fictioning look like? Um, but that's another kind of, that's another bit on the end. So um, I mentioned the stuff about reality and fiction and how I, I think I had, a real, I had an investment in Burroughs' notions of control and Deleuze's notion of control. But if that notion of control still has a useful term in this, kind of t this new terrain, um, 
that it, and it seems to me it names less any univocal or transcendent enunciator, to use Guattari's term, and more of these different practices and technologies of the management of reality, the calibration of risk. So control names this increasingly uncertain and unpredictable terrain of chaos and contingency. So with David and I, I think, with our positions very much that this loss of recourse to a truth, or indeed authenticity, is not to be lamented exactly, but to be worked worked with. I mean, I, you know, and in that way, I think, um, although in many ways, the whole project of fictioning that David and I are involved in pitches itself against kind of sort of a rationalist new Prometheanism, but on the other hand, the idea in a kind of, well, like the idea that alienation is method or it's a given state is, is somehow in play in the book as well, or the, the project. So fictioning in this form as mythotachnesis involves exploring this new field but also the possibilities and co-evolutions, the nuptial, nuptials and monstrous couplings of nature and technology. And uh, that's, that's kind of uh, technogenesis, really, kind of this kind of man-machine interface. And what, um, particularly in how art practice is at the stuttering fringe of that, you know, and how, I mean, Dave's really interested in people like One Otrix, Point Never, and certain visual sonic experimentation that's kind of playing around with that edge. But all this stuff about technology, I think, also means that the terrain of politics and the idea of a whole idea of an engaged art practice is changing. So with this computational turn, and indeed a form of preemptive politics, it's become a norm, just as algorithmically determined marketing strategies have changed the very nature of subjectivity. We're all digital subjects now. It's this wider field of social media, collapsing of time, that's now a dominant reality, at least in the West. And these developments, when the web in particular, have also heralded the emergence of a new populism, the foregrounding of previously niche groupings. In fact, I think these two go hand in hand. I think a case study here is the growth of the alt-right, and especially relevant to our own work, the deployment of a specific mythos instantiated especially in meme magic. You know, which you could say is a contemporary instantiation of Deuteronomon or the sigil. Um, so I think to a certain extent the web is allowing this more complex temporality to emerge, these different niche groups to forge around themselves, different fictions in past, present and future feedback on one another. And this is what we refer to in our conversation as the looping function of fictioning. So just to finish, it seems to me, or it has seemed to me in the last few years, that it's not really enough to retreat to melancholy or even to be involved in myth critique, or not just myth critique. Uh, you know, that kind of myth analysis and myth critique is important, but it doesn't seem enough. Um, you know, to a certain extent, I'm sceptical about any truth below the myths, but it seems to me it's better rather to start building better myths. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.